Well, dear friends, uh, we are uh, not in the uh, uh, area of church affairs, maybe, but we are in the area of uh, taking care of uh, uh, what uh, is uh, given to us uh, from creation or the um, evolution. Uh, we have uh, the eternal question of uh, taking care of our uh, environment. Charles Dickens uh, f uh, has a famous quote from his uh, uh, novel, uh, Tale of Two Cities. Um, and also in Hard Times, he um, wrote about environmental concerns. So this is nothing modern, nothing new uh, today. Uh, to the contrary, uh, this year we celebrate uh, his 200th anniversary. And um, his quote seems oddly modern even today. Mm -hmm. And also in Norwegian literature, the environment has been theme of conflict and distress in Henrik Ibsen's uh, Enemy of the People. It's exactly the question of environment uh, that has to yield to economic interests. Uh, that is the center of uh, that play. And the questions uh, are as relevant today as they were in uh, the 1880s. Our concerns now are by no means new, but they are maybe feeling more acute. These columns show energy consumptions in the year 2010 and prospects for 2050. As you can see, the OECD countries uh, are expected to increase their consumptions sli slightly. The BRICs, however, are expected to more than double their energy consumption and the rest of the world will triple their use of energy over the next 40 years. And the bottom line is this, by 2050, the world economy will have quadrupled and we will use 80% more energy than today. But the story doesn't end there. This figure so shows the mix of energy sources in our consumption. Again, we see figures for 2010 and prospects for 2050. And the prospects are dire. Non-renewables are basically more prominent and are expected to account for more than 80%. There are, however, and you have been discussing this uh, uh, during the seminars, other reasons to be more optimistic. The global investments in renewable energy has increased substantially over the last few years. Also, the world capacity for renewable energy produ uh, production is increasing. And these graphs show the increase in world's capacity for wind power and solar power. Wind power being a more established, uh, established source of energy is higher, but both sources show a healthy growth. Still, as of today, renewables only account for about 16% of all energy sources. If you take away traditional biomass, firewood, there is only 6% left. And if we go on as today, the baseline scenario is that nothing will change by 2050. Uh, this is like a weather forecast. Uh, they would be very close to as accurate as they are today if they always predicted the weather tomorrow uh, the same as the weather today. Um, and uh, we can't take that out, out of the equa uh, equation that the result might be that development will continue as today. The exception, of course, being that total energy consumption has risen prominently. Of course, you know this. This is why you are here, and this is uh, what's uh, on the agenda in this conference. I'm merely laying the ground for my main topic. How do we, as nations and as the world, transcend from today's state to a green economy. First of all, there are, as underlined by today's conference headline, shared possibilities. The UN's report of last year shows that in a 2% investment scenario, a green economy can be profitable. Second of all, shared possibilities will only be realized through shared, um, uh, uh, shared possibilities will only be realized through shared responsibilities. If we are to transcend to green growth equilibrium, we need collective action. Let me elaborate on what I mean with collective action. Firstly, policies must promote green growth through regulation and through pricing of energy. Um, we, need, uh, we need a broad consensus on the need of political action. And the laissez-faire liberalist 
anti-government uh, forces is, I think, the main obstacle to reach uh, this goal. We need uh, politicians uh, that can act. We need politicians, politi politicians uh, who believe in politics. That's uh, uh, an advantage. Um, <laughs> uh, and we need politicians who believe in science. Because that's also an issue. That's on the agenda. Do we live uh, in, in uh, uh, the, uh, the enlightened age, or are we going back uh, where science and facts and, and, and scientific methods uh, are not uh, valued anymore? Um, policies uh, must uh, construct the pricing mechanisms that leads, uh, lead us in the right uh, way. Take, for instance, solar power. Every year, the sun shines the equi uh, equivalent of somewhere between 700 and 1,100 kilowatt hours upon each square meter of Norway. That is about 700 times as high as our yearly consumption of energy. Now, I'm not saying that Norway will be a country living uh, from sun um, uh, power. I think uh, solar power, uh, we are strong in metals and... and, and uh, ingredients to the solar uh, industries, but solar energy will probably not be our strongest uh, uh, case in Norway. Uh, but we aren't even using the units of solar power that technology permits, and the reason is costs. This figure shows the marginal cost of producing energy of various kinds. The figure is from French energy market, but I think it applies uh, to us as well. Uh, the column to the far right uh, depicts the cost of solar power production. And you don't need a degree in economics to see solar power is going to be uh, uh, expensive. There is no way a totally deregulated market will ensure a supply of solar power at all, as long as the relative costs are this high. There are three solutions to this problem, if we are serious about increasing the use and production of solar power. Two are regulatory, and one is technological. A, we can lower the relative price of solar power through subsidies. Or B, we can increase the relative pr prices of the alternatives. We can tax pollution and thus put a price uh, on affecting the environment. And C, we can find, of course, better and cheaper ways of producing solar power. And that brings me to the second point of order for collective action. Research communities and businesses must cooperate on commercialization of technological solutions. It is not just enough to invent uh, um, new technologies. Technologies have to be put into use. There are many examples of successful corporations. Let me show you one from Norway, the hybrid vessel Viking Lady. The Viking Lady has been called the prize of the seas. Um, in 2009, the Viking Lady was the first vessel ever to operate on a fuel cell power pack. This was a result of cooperation between Aid Siva Shipping, the DNV, and the Norwegian Research Council. Now the vessel is setting new records with the first true hybrid system to be installed on board and uh, an offshore supply vessel. Compared to conventional offshore vessels, there is a potential not only for carbon emissions reductions of 50%, but also a reduction in energy consumption of about 20 to 30 percent. And to put this in some perspective, globally ships account for about 3 percent of all CO2 emissions. There is no doubt a decrease of 50 percent would in fact matter. Of course, if we are to transcend to a new green world economy, isolated examples are not sufficient. And that leads me to the third point, in order for collective action. Researchers, businesses, and policymakers alike must cooperate on infrastructure in order to make green technologies not only viable, but profitable. There are many examples. Don't you think the electric car would be more in demand if there was as many charging stations as there are petrol stations? And wouldn't the cost of wind power go down as the number of windmills goes up? And what about LNG? How can we promote LNG-driven vessels if the harbors are not suited for LNG vessels? 
Let me be the first to admit, infrastructure is difficult. First and foremost, because the costs involved, the long-term investments. Um, for any large infrastructure uh, operation or grid, there are bound to be enormous sunk costs. Furthermore, there are prominent economic externalities to consider. Everyone will want to take part uh, once the infrastructure is in place, but no one wants to pay for them. This is true for businesses as well as nations. However, policymakers can contribute through international regulation, and businesses can contribute both by reacting to incentives mechanisms and by reacting to early mover incentives. We know regulations will come. The price of pollution will go up. There is no alternative. Thus, there are profits to be gained from adjusting to those regulations even before they agree in place. As for the research community, researchers can help sway both businesses and politics, make infrastructure cheaper, better and easier, and businesses will follow lead. If you think I stress profitability a lot, uh, that's true. And I do it because business and environmental concerns are so tightly bound together. On the one hand, industry, and especially manufacturing, has been challenged as polluters in many different uh, inst instances. On the other hand, the business opportunities in green innovation have given uh, rise to new industries and changed existing industries. In Norway, we have seen uh, notable new industries appear. Our long and windy coastline has been a fertile, fertile ground for the development of offshore wind power facilities. Our traditional strength in material sciences gave rise to the solar power industry, an industry that now appears to be partly on the move again. But even in our traditional industries, such as shipping and the maritime industry, a greener approach has strengthened the comp competitive position of Norwegian companies. For instance, we have seen development of ships, engines that run on, on less polluting fuels, and we have seen systems for handling wastewater, a major challenge in the maritime industries. This form of innovation promotes the environment, but they also help modernizing existing industries and thereby promote growth. Last summer, the Norwegian government presented a comprehensive strategy for green growth and industri in industry development. The strategy was co-signed by myself and the Minister of Environment and has two primary goals. One, to marshal policies to, to develop competitive industries and businesses, and two, to help us reach our environmental targets. Our efforts are currently concentrated on a number of fields, and I'll just mention a few of them. But this this combination where you mobilize the whole creative potential uh, of entrepreneurs, of uh, industry uh, scientists, uh, of, uh, of uh, skilled workers and unskilled workers in the whole area uh, of businesses. That's when you really can get results. Firstly, we have launched a program dedicated to support sustainable industrial uh, development based on environmentally friendly technologies. By 2013, we will grant 500 million kroner for ecotech purposes. That's roughly 65 million euro. The grants will mainly go to projects that have a strong experimental development profile, including pilots and the establishment of demonstration facilities. Second, there is networking and cooperation. We have uh, established an advisory council and, char and charged it with advising on grant agreements in our dedicated programs and contributing to stronger cooperation among public policy actors relevant to green growth support. Thirdly, we emphasize uh, R&D and qualifications. A first step in this direction was to increase the grants for our centers for research-based innovation with a view to strengthen eco-friendly efforts under the scheme. We want Norway to be an attractive country for ecotech industries of all nationalities. In order for that to happen, we need leading technology and knowledge hubs. The fourth point on this list is environmental regulation. On the one hand, there are the national initiatives. We will, in our national efforts, actively use rules, regulations, and standards to strengthen the development and adoption of green technologies. On the other hand, there are international efforts, 
and the Norwegian government will continue its strong support for common frameworks that promote the development and use of eco technologies. The fifth point from the strategy that I will mention is public and private procurement. The government in most countries is a big customer uh, in all areas and, and all fields. And the government in Norway wants to strengthen skills and qualification in our public agencies when it comes to green purchases and to develop a dialogue between policy buyers uh, uh, and private businesses that you have this connection and the discussion, and not only lowest possible price on all technologies, but instead stimulate to innovation, new solutions, green technologies. We're also concerned that private firms should increase their awareness and efforts to support the environment in their procurement policies. The sixth and final point is continued knowledge-based policy evolution. The Norwegian government supports and participates in several international efforts to strengthen our knowledge and expertise in these matters. For example, the Prime Minister, the Minister of Foreign Affairs, and the Minister of Finance were all active participants during the presentation of OECD's Green Growth Strategy in Paris last spring. Finally, our policy measures reflect the very fact that we need to move, move towards a greener economy. It's a prerequisite in our efforts to solve the environmental challenges we all face in the future. At the same time, green technologies comprise some of the most promising business markets in the world. We strongly believe that we can create a basis for long-term economic success with a smaller environmental footprint. And think about it. This continent, Europe, the Eurozone has negative growth. 2012, the Euro, the, the, uh, and, the, and Europe as a whole has zero growth. We need a boost. We need something that can lift us out of recession. And a big step forward into a green economy could be exactly that, combining uh, new industries, uh, new uh, workplaces, and new growth with environmental concerns. And by simultaneously putting in place uh, incitements for consumers and businesses, we will support both the supply and demand for greener products. And as you all know, last year the UN stated that a green business investment of 2% of global GDP, 2% of global GDP, I mean, Sweden uh, fell by 6% of GDP during the financial crisis. We're talking about 2% of, of global GDP would more than pay for itself in the form of millions of new jobs through the development of new industries, health benefits from cleaner air, energy efficiency savings, and last but not least, a reduction in greenhouse gas emissions. Last year, Stephen Chu, the United States Secretary of Energy, was quoted in the Scientific American as saying, China missed the first industrial revolution, missed the computer revolution, and the biology revolution. They want to be a leader in the green revolution. India is taking the same path, looking uh, how they can overstep the, uh, the polluting industrial revolution and going straight into the green economy. There is plenty at stake, there are high ambitions, and the winners of the green revolution will surely be winners of the 21st century globally, global economy. We should welcome this competition, not the race to the moon, but the race to the earth, the race to preserve this planet for the coming generation. Technology can help us, policymakers can help us, entrepreneurs in all sectors, in businesses and research communities combined can help us finding those solutions. Thank you for your attention.